Conduction. This does occur within metals. Conduction is the process by which heat is transferred directly through a material without with any bulk motion of the material playing no role in the transfer. By bulk motion, I just mean movement of the material, like, like a gas or, or a liquid, like we do in convection. Here we're talking about, think about it as a piece of metal, and the, the molecules can jiggle around a little bit, but you can't move one molecule past another. So there's no bulk motion that's responsible for this. It's a different mechanism, and it relates back to our conversation about temperature in the first place. The um, conduction occurs when the atoms or molecules in a hotter part of the material vibrate with greater energy than those in a cooler part. So if we have a, a molecule right here, it's vibrating around rapidly, random thermal vibrations. And we've got a, a molecule here that's not uh, at such a high temperature, well, or an atom in, in, a, in, a, in a metal. This this hotter one can bump into that one and transfer some of his energy. And in fact, that's the way the energy is transferred by conduction. So the, those in the hotter part vibrate with greater energy, and by means of collisions, they transfer their energy to the less energetic neighbors. And then this transfers some energy to his neighbor, and then so on. So we get a heat flow again from the warmer body to the cooler body, always from the warmer to the cooler. Um, what materials that conduct heat well, it's called conduction, remember. So it's, it's actually um, easy to con confuse this with electrical conduction. But here we're not talking about electrical conduction. We're talking about thermal conduction, how well a, a metal or an other material conducts heat not electricity. So good mat materials that conduct well are called thermal conductors, and those that conduct heat poorly are called thermal insulators. State the heat conduction equation. So this is going to relate to the R values of your insulation in your home, and we'll, we'll definitely relate it in just a couple slides. State the heat conduction equation and define the thermal conductivity. So the heat conducted. That's measured in joules. So heat is energy. It's, it's the energy transferred, right, from one object to another, usually, well, from hot to cold. It's measured in joules. How much heat is going to be conducted? Well, it's going to depend on the temperature difference between the two. So if this is at a temperature T naught, and this is at a temperature T naught plus delta T. So the temperature difference between the warm body and the cold body is delta T. That's here, the temperature difference. Well, the bigger the temperature difference between these two objects, the greater the amount of heat that's going to be transferred. For example, if it's a uh, 80 degree day outside and you're trying to keep your house at 72 degrees, the amount of heat transferred from the outside to the inside of your house is going to be less than if it's a 90 degree day outside. You're going to get more heat transfer from the outside to the inside of your house and your, your uh, heating, your heater or your air conditioner is going to have to work harder. So that's why um, the heat conducted is greater, uh, increases with the, the temperature difference. Um, it will increase with time. The longer you go, the greater the amount of heat that will be conducted from the outside to the inside. It's just, that's just to say that um, during a four-hour period, you're going to conduct more heat from the outside to the inside of your house than you are during a two-hour two period of time. No big deal. Uh, it's going to be proportional to the area, cross-sectional area. So that's this area right here. The greater the area, the bigger your house, the more heat's going to be transferred, the bigger the furnace you need to offset that heat transfer. That's cross-sectional area. Um, time we've talked about. L is the actual length. 
So this will be the thickness of your walls and thinking about uh, the, the house analogy. Um, here's the outside of your house. Here's your wall insulation. And here's the inside of your house that you're hoping to keep cool. So there will always be heat transfer during a hot day. There will be heat transfer from the outside to the inside of your house. You can't prevent it. It's going to happen. You try to minimize it by putting in insulation, but it will happen. And the smaller the, the thickness of the insulating material, the, the thinner the insulating material, the smaller the L value, and the greater the heat transferred. So you want as great a thickness of insulation as you can to get uh, that to happen. That's it. Q equals KAT delta T divided by L. And here are the units of what's called the thermal conductivity. So you want a thermal conduct, if you want an insulator, uh, insulating material, the fiberglass insulation or blown in insulation or whatever for your house, you want the one with the lowest thermal conductivity. You don't want it to conduct heat well. You want to conduct heat poorly. So you want the lowest possible thermal conductivity. And the highest R value is what it's called. Um, so here's some thermal conductivities for various materials. I've uh, put green boxes around aluminum, which is 240 joule per second per meter, uh, joule per second meter degree C, and air, which is 0 0.0256 joule per second meter degree C. So which one conducts heat the best? Aluminum. And air doesn't conduct heat very well at all, unless there's convection. And then, then it can. This is where we're, ta we're talking about static air, not moving. And that, as we'll see, has, plays a role in insulation. If you can keep that air not moving, then you can do a good job of insulating. That's why people in, in down sleeping bags, you like a lot of air pockets but small air pockets so that the, you can't get convection inside of those air pockets. Styrofoam is 0.01. is the other one that we want to uh, think about. Okay, a demo. This is a demonstration of thermal conductivity. Just like different materials conduct electricity better, some better than others, uh, different materials conduct heat better than others. Here are two materials, uh, both pretty much the same size, both uh, look pretty much the same. I've got an O-ring here to contain uh, the ice, and we're going to um, investigate the differences in thermal conductivity. So here I've got some ice. I'm going to put some on, on each one. And um, Start the stopwatch. So as you can see, in, in maybe 20 seconds of time, the ice has melted that's on top of this material here. And the ice has hardly, hardly started to melt on, the, um, on top of the other block. What's the difference? This block is actually aluminum, which is one of the best thermal conductors uh, of the known materials that we have that are easily accessible. This one is a, is a foam material, has a lot of air pockets in it, and it's a very poor thermal conductor. The curious thing about this demo is that if I were to hand you 
Uh, and before I put the ice on these, if I were to hand you these two uh, materials, you would have felt this one and felt it to be warm. And immediately, even though they're, uh, before I put the ice on it, even before uh, the ice was placed on it, you would have felt this aluminum to be cold. And the reason is that your body temperature is greater than the room temperature. So when your warm hand touches the uh, room temperature aluminum, because the aluminum is a, is a very good thermal conductor, the heat from your hand immediately goes into the aluminum. And it feels cold to you because it's, it's taking heat away from your hand. Just exactly the opposite thing happened when we placed the ice on it. it um, the ice is colder than the aluminum. And the aluminum would have felt warm to the ice and, and vice versa. There's a heat transfer from the warmer aluminum, the room temperature aluminum, into the uh, freezing ice. And um, that's uh, thermal conductivity. All right. Which of the following statements concerning thermal conductors is true? A good thermal conductor is often a poor electrical conductor. That's actually not true. A good thermal conductor is often more likely to be a gas than a solid. Well, we saw that aluminum was a really good thermal conductor. So that's, and that air was a poor thermal conductor. So that's not true. A good thermal conductor is often also a good electrical conductor. And this is actually true. Aluminum is a good electrical conductor, and um, it's also a good thermal conductor. And it's generally true that good thermal conductors are good electrical conductors. Uh, in subsequent chapters, we'll talk about electrical conduction as well. So um, as we mentioned before, trapped air spaces are really, really good for insulation. And now we can understand why. Materials with small dead air spaces are excellent thermal insulators because these spaces inhibit convective heat transfer and because air has a low thermal conductivity. Doesn't if, if you can hold that air still, you can really insulate well. So for our value, I thought it might be nice to, to relate this to something that you might be familiar with. There's a R13 insulation, I think there's R19 insulation, different thicknesses of insulation that you can put in your home. Uh, what do those R values mean? The R value is nothing more or less than the thickness L of the insulator divided by the thermal conductivity. So, uh, and the R values are measured in meters squared degrees C seconds per joule, which, um, which you can get by dividing L by K. So L is measured in meters and K is measured in joules per second per second meter degree C. So you end up with a meter squared C seconds in the numerator and a joule in the denominator. So that's the actual units. If you want to impress your friends at Lowe's, um, you can just say, I want R13, which means 13 meter squared uh, degree C seconds per joule. Um, so for a five centimeter, two inch thick polystyrene foam board, um, the thickness is five centimeters, so that's 0.05 meters. So that's that uh, thickness here. K is polystyrene 0.01. It um, has an R value of five, which is, um, is better than the sharp stick in the eye, uh, not as good as some of the other insulators you might get. Standard fiberglass installation used between walls in residential homes has an R value of 13. The rate of heat flow through a wall of a house does not depend on which of the following quantities. Great question. The dimensions of the wall. Well, it does. It depends on the area of the wall. Remember, there's an area in that formula. The thickness of the wall, well, it does depend on the thickness of the wall, for sure. The spe specific heat capacity of the wall. What about that one? 
So this measures how much uh, heat you need to add to the wall to raise its temperature. But we're not talking about raising the temperature of the wall. We're talking about a wall being at 90 degrees Fahrenheit outside and 72 degrees Fahrenheit inside. So we're not talking about actually changing the temperature of the wall. As we move through the wall, the temperature will go uniform slowly from 90 degrees to 72 degrees. So you go from the outside of the wall on a hot day to the inside of the wall. The specific heat capacity talks about raising the whole temperature of the wall, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the transfer of, of heat through the wall to the inside of the house. The temperature's outside and inside the house. So it does depend on that, um, of the temperature difference. Um, well, let's see, rate of heat flow through the wall. Yeah, so it, it does depend on the dimensions of the wall. It does depend uh, the rate of heat flow on the thickness of the wall. It does depend on the difference in the temperatures between the outside and the inside, which is 90 minus 72. Convert that to degrees Celsius. Uh, it does depend on the thermal conductivity of the wall. That tells how well that wall conducts. But it does not depend on the specific heat capacity of the wall. Igloos, uh, protection from wintery conditions. Ice and snow walls act as thermal insulation and minimize the loss of heat through conduction. Pretty picture, wow. One wall of a house consists of a, ply a plywood backed by insulation. The thermal conductivity of the insulation and plywood are respectively 0.03 and 0.08. And the area of the wall is 35 square meters. Find the amount of heat conducted through the wall in one hour. So we've got, this is a cold day. So here's outside, 4 degrees C, just above freezing. Here's inside, 25 degrees C, roughly uh, room temperature. So since the inside is now at a higher temperature, the heat flow is from inside to outside. And, and please uh, don't embarrass me. Uh, and talk about the cold flowing into the house. Cold doesn't flow, heat flows. So heat flows from, always from hot to cold. So when you're saying, shut the door, you're letting the cold air in, um, I'd rather you think about it as shut the door, you're letting the hot air out. <laughs> the tra transfer of heat from hotter to, to colder. Um, so now in this particular case, we have to ask about the uh, the amount of heat conducted through the wall in one hour. Well, the amount of heat, the number of joules per second transferred through the insulation has to be the same as the amount of heat transferred through the plywood. Why is that? Otherwise, they'd be heating up and things wouldn't be staying at a, at a uniform temperature. So that's why we're saying that the heat that goes through, heat transferred through the insulation equals the heat that goes through the plywood. So that through the insulation is all these numbers applied to the insulation. The, for plywood is all these numbers applied to the plywood. Plugging in the numbers that we do have, um, we're looking at the intermediate temperature right here. We know this temperature at the outside of this wall is four degrees. And at the inside of the wall is 25 degrees. But we're going to expect that temperature to go slowly and uniformly down until we get to this spot, which is the temperature at the interface between the insulation and the plywood. And that's what we're going to try to find. So the heat through the insulation. Well, here's the thermal conductivity of the insulation. Here's the area of the insulation. And here's 25 minus T. That's the temperature difference across this insulation, 25 minus T. We expect T to be somewhere between 25 and 4. So the temperature difference across the insulation is 25 minus T. That's this. 
times the time, divided by the thickness of the insulation, um, 0.076, I don't see where we're given that. Um, I guess that is what it is. Oh, there it is. Here's the insulation, 0.076 uh, meters. Then over here on the plywood side, so we're talking about the heat that goes through the plywood. The heat that goes through the insulation and the heat that goes through the plywood has to be the same, otherwise there's going to be heat um, getting lost or gained somehow. The uh, thermal conductivity of the plywood, I believe we're given that. Yeah, that's right up here. Uh, the area, that's a cross-sectional area now is what I'm talking about here. This length times width, that's that times the temperature difference across the plywood. Well, this, this left edge of the plywood is going to be at a higher temperature than the right edge. So T minus 4 will be that temperature difference times T divided by 0.019. That's that number right there. So now, lo and behold, the little T's, the times, cancel. The areas cancel. And we're left with an equation that involves a temperature on the right side and a temperature on the left side. And we'll give you some chances to uh, solve problems like this. In order to solve for the temperature, there's only one variable in this equation, it's the, the temperature. But you're going to need to get this term over to the left side or this term on the left side over to the right side, combine and solve for the temperature, which turns out to be 5.8 degrees. And you might say, wow, that was a lot of work uh, to get a to not get the answer that they're looking for. It's kind of embarrassing. Well, um, we're supposed to be finding the amount of heat conducted through the wall in one hour, but all we found was the temperature at the interface between the insulation and the wood. But never fear. Now that we know that temperature, we can calculate the uh, heat, heat um, flow. Here's the heat flow through the insulation, 0.03, that's the same uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, 35 square meters, we're told, is the, uh, the cross-sectional area. And that's the overall area uh, of, of your home. So you can say uh, the area of this wall is 10 feet by 14 feet or whatever it is, and this wall is 8 feet by 10 feet. Uh, just add up all those areas for your house is the way that you can go about these to find that total area. Then. Um, now we know the temperature difference across that insulator. It's 25 minus 5.8, because we found the temperature at the interface between the two. Uh, for one hour, it's 3,600 seconds divided by 0 0.076. That gives us uh, 9.5 times 10 to the fifth joules of energy that goes through, uh, of heat that goes through that wall in, in one hour's time. And you might say, well, why didn't we, uh, why did we use the heat flow through the insulation? Why couldn't we just use the heat flow through the plywood? And I would say, if you've done the math right, you'll get exactly the same answer. Because remember, we said that the heat flow through the insulation has to be the same as the heat flow through the plywood. Fruit growers. Sometimes protective crops by spraying them with water when overnight temperatures are expecting to dry, expected to drop below freezing. Might seem like a stupid thing to do. Uh, strawberries can withstand temperatures down to freezing, zero degrees C, but not below. When water is sprayed on the plants, it can freeze and release heat, some of which goes into warming the plant. So when you freeze something, you freeze the water, you can release some heat and some of that goes into uh, warming up the strawberries. Pretty cool. Um, and then the other part of it is that water and ice have small thermal conductivities and act as thermal insulators. So once you've got that la coat, coated layer of, of ice around the strawberry, it tends to insulate the strawberry from the colder temperatures. Why is it warm in bed? Say, I want to get into my warm bed. What does that mean? Well, if you think about it, that bed isn't warm until you get in it. 
it's cold. But the blankets and the sheets are good thermal insulators. So the initial shock of the cold uh, sheets and blankets is, is uh, quickly overcome by the fact that you're providing some heat and that heat is contained by the, the blankets and, and comforts, etc. So your bed isn't warm. Sorry. You're not getting into a warm bed. You're getting into a cold bed. You are warm. And so it might be better to say, I'm getting into a, a well-insulated bed so that it can retain my own body heat. <laughs>